Today, we are going to talk to Neil Deswani, who is kind of not your um, typical uh, faculty member you might have heard from before. He also has led so many uh, industry jobs and he has so much experience in the field. Like he, he worked in research development, teaching and executive roles uh, at companies like Symantec and LifeLog. Twitter, et cetera. And right now he's working actually as chief cyber sec chief information security officer at QuantumScape. So he really brings the industry perspective in. And we are so glad that he took the time to join us for this webinar. I think without further ado, uh, I think we can kick it off, Neil. Um, thank you so much once again for joining us. Great. Thank you, Petra, for having me. I always love doing webinars uh, and courses for Stanford. So in today's webinar, we're going to talk about breaking and entering into the cybersecurity field. I'm going to talk a little bit about just the uh, cybersecurity landscape, uh, you know, how many jobs are out there, what kind of jobs are there, uh, depending upon what you're doing today, what might be some potential paths uh, going forward, and look forward to covering all that and then hopefully answering some questions. So. Let's uh, go ahead and get started. So first of all, what has been going on in the cybersecurity field? There have been, over the past 17 years, there have been over 20,000 breaches that have taken place, data breaches and other kinds of breaches. Uh, there's been almost 2 billion consumer records that have been impacted. There has been a whole bunch of different root causes for these breaches. On this slide on the top right, it shows some of those root causes. We can see that most of them are due to hacking of various kinds. Uh, there's a large uh, percentage that's also uh, unknown and uncategorized. Uh, there's uh, you know, a small number of insider attacks. There's, you know, if you look at uh, some of the other bars together uh, with regards to portable devices or physical security and the red and green, if you combine those, uh, there, there's been a lot of breaches due to lost or stolen uh, media. There's been some organizations that have just gotten breached over and over again. And so if you kind of look at field overall, we've got to ask ourselves, well, what's, what's, what's been going on here? And about uh, two years ago, uh, myself and uh, Moody el Bayadi, we published uh, a book entitled uh, Big Breaches, which dives into these root causes. If we go to the next slide here, uh, one of the things that I want to note is that the first state law around data breaches and the requirement of reporting data breaches to the government to say state attorney generals that law was first passed in 2003 in california and since then there has been a lot of data that's been aggregated around uh, breaches that have taken place and just that reporting is a great first step to first of all understand what's going on if people are getting attacked and we don't share the information about who got attacked, how they got attacked, how can we do better next time, then it's hard for the field to, to advance. Now, looking 10 years later after 2003, what happened in the landscape is that a whole bunch of mega breaches started, starting with Target, followed by JP Morgan Chase, followed by the US government's Office of Personnel Management. And then year after year after year, there's pretty much some big breach of, of uh, one kind or another. The largest breach in the history of the internet as measured by the number of accounts that were compromised uh, happened due to Yahoo back in 2016. The largest uh, cloud security breach, as we know, there's a lot of services that are moving from on-premise data centers to clouds run by Amazon and uh, Microsoft and Google. And uh, the largest cloud security data breach was due to Capital One back in 2019. Uh, the largest financial identity breach occurred in 2017 uh, at Equifax, approximately half of the country's uh, personally identifiable, I the personally identifiable information associated with financial uh, credit applications was, was stolen from Equifax. So there's been more and more impact due to these breaches. So uh, looking even just two years ago, we had seen the Colonial Oil Pipeline get breached. Uh, attackers had shut down the oil pipeline for about a week. They demanded a ransomware payment in excess of $4 million, which uh, the CEO at Colonial Pipeline paid after a week. Um, and after that particular incident, 
ransomware got declared as a national security threat, and Biden issued an executive order around uh, protecting the, the assets of federal agencies and directing them to uh, put more defenses in for their supply chain. So there's a deep, deep need to have more people enter this field. One of the questions that might come to your mind is, wow, this all sounds pretty darn bad. How did we get to this point? And if we go back to the 1970s, when the internet was first designed, the TCP and IP standards were first designed, um, security was a bit of an afterthought in the initial design of those protocols that now run the internet. But there, and there were many proposals as to how to network the world together at that time. But TCP IP won out because of the fact that it was relatively simple and it was it had a whole bunch of interoperability benefits, whereas a bunch of other protocols were more complicated, uh, were not as interoperable, maybe had more security thrown there up front, but got in the way of adoption. And so TCP had TCP and IP had just an amazing amount of success with regards to getting adopted like wildfire, um, you know, by by you know first here in the U.S. with the ARPANET, and then as the internet got commercialized in the 1990s, uh, all all around the world. Um, if we think about what are the root causes of data breaches that have taken place, there's probably only about a handful of them, which is kind of interesting given that. There has been so many security compliance standards that have been developed over time, whether it's PCI, HIPAA, um, ISO 27000, whatever it happens to be. Each of these compliance standards have two or three hundred different checkboxes, and companies go around checking them. The irony of it all is that most organizations that get breached have been compliant with one or more security standards at the time of breach. So we've got to ask ourselves what's going on. One of the things that um, uh, that, that, that we've done is identified, you know, looking at all these breaches, what have been the root causes of these breaches? And there's typically, you know, just five or six of them. Uh, things like phishing and account takeover, malicious software, software vulnerabilities, uh, account takeover, uh, unencrypted data. And the reason that these root causes exist is because you know, going back to the initial design of, for instance, the email security, the email protocols on the internet, there was no security built in. Right when the ARPANET was just a set of military institutions and um, you know educational institutions communicating with each other, pretty much just in the U.S., every institution trusted every institution. Anybody could send an email to anybody else, claiming to be whoever they wanted to be. Um, and over time, as the internet got commercialized, there have been more email security protocols that have been put in place. But we we still phishing is still one of the most common root causes of breach. Um, you know, there, there's there's a lot of other kind of history and background as to why there's still so many vulnerabilities in browsers and plug into the browsers and web applications, um, you know, uh, that, that I won't get into here, but, but I guess I just want to comment that there's kind of a long history of, you know, why we are at the place that we're at. And my hope and expectation is that over the coming decades, more and more countermeasures and defenses will be put in place from a technical perspective, but also we'll all get more educated, just as was the case with uh, cars and driving. It wasn't until the, you know, you know while uh, automobiles started coming out in the 1920s, it really wasn't until the 1960s and 70s that, for instance, Volvo came out with the first lap and shoulder seatbelt. And, um, you know, people, it, it then became a law that you have to wear the seatbelt, right? So over time, I look forward to seeing the cybersecurity industry and the industry overall, uh, you know, benefit more and more from from the learnings from from breaches. With regards to where we are in terms of employment, in terms of cybersecurity employment in the United States, there are currently about 1.1 million people employed in the cybersecurity field in the U.S., which is which is good, but there are over 750,000 jobs that are currently open. There's a website called cyberseek.org that tracks open cybersecurity jobs and how many people are employed. And you can go to their website to see some of those stats. There's a whole variety of jobs that need to be filled in the cybersecurity field. Probably one of the most common 
jobs that need to be filled, the, the, the entry level position in the field is that of a cybersecurity analyst. Last I checked the statistics on the US uh, uh, Labor Bureau, there were over 130,000 cybersecurity analyst jobs available. And we'll talk about what cybersecurity analysts do, but there is also a whole bunch of other roles that are required and needed, cybersecurity engineers, managers, systems engineers, software developers, penetration testers, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of myths that exist. So I had done some searching as to, uh, you know, around articles as to why there aren't more people in the field. And it turns out that there's a bunch of myths uh, as to why people don't enter the cybersecurity field. One of those myths is that you have to be super technical. You have to be a computer genius. Uh, that is just simply not the case. You don't have to be super technical. You don't have to be a genius to enter the cybersecurity field. We need all kinds of all kinds of people um, to help uh, not just you know build defenses, but deploy defenses. We need project managers. You know, one of the things about cybersecurity is that in most companies, you might have a cybersecurity team. But that cybersecurity team is typically a small percentage of the number of employees that are um, hired into the into the software organization or into the IT organization. Um, cybersecurity is also not just an IT problem. So in order to roll out a whole bunch of changes across a company, you need project managers, you need program managers. Um, you know, one way to look at the security team is there might be a small number of security Jedis, but you know, we need the help of a clone army to roll out some of the defenses and to uh, execute on those defenses in order to defend a, a company. Uh, people used to think that cybersecurity is a narrow field. Cybersecurity is definitely not a narrow field anymore, even if it might have been a narrow field 20 or 30 years ago. Um, you know, if you look at most chief information security officers, uh, the types of people, uh, you know, that head up security for an organization, they also don't know everything about the field. They, you know, one of the things I'll talk about is that they may need to have certain areas of expertise, but they, they don't know everything. And so it's a very, it's a very broad field now. So I'm not going to go through each of these myths, but except to just say that they're, they're, they're false. And I'll pick maybe, maybe one additional one around the hours and the pay for cybersecurity are not good. Uh, let's talk about that actually right now. So looking at this data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics from uh, just about one year ago, the average wage for the entry level position of an information security analyst in the field is a six figure salary of one hundred and twelve thousand um, dollars. I think the laws of supply and demand apply to cybersecurity just as they apply to everything else. As per one of the things that we talked about on a previous slide, there is a negative employment rate of 75%. We need so many more people to enter this field. There's a relatively short supply of cybersecurity professionals. And as a result, you know, given the demand, their 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 salaries are gonna be are gonna be higher than average. Now, one of the things that I'll also mention is that uh, whatever you decide to do in life, um, you should uh, you know, do it primarily for, for the enjoyment. Um, we'll talk about some of the characteristics. Um, definitely need to smart, you know, work smart and work hard. But one of the things to keep in mind is that you know, if you're good at what you do, you'll probably earn more money doing it than if you're, if you're not as good. So that applies to cybersecurity as well. We can see that the, the lowest 10% has an annual wage of $66,000, the um, highest 90% uh, you know, Percentile for the same role for the same role is one hundred seventy four thousand dollars a year, whereas the median is one hundred twelve thousand. So those are just some statistics uh, around um, around around that. And so, uh, you know, if there was a previous myth that the hours and the pay for cybersecurity are not good, that is, that is not true. The pay uh, can be very good with regards to hours. I think that people in the field are also realizing that it's important that you have work-life balance if you want to avoid having your best people burn out, for instance. And so a lot of times companies will hire third-party uh, security operation centers or they'll hire folks to work in shifts uh, you know, as needed 
kind of around the globe, follow the sun eight hours in different geographies uh, to even just handle the most significant, most uh, high pressure incident response jobs. But many of the jobs in cybersecurity uh, can have a very good balance. And it's really dependent upon the management of the organization and what kind of culture they uh, look at creating. So what is driving all of these jobs? Why are there so many uh, people that are that are needed? And there's, I, I found a great article by uh, Amit Doshi on LinkedIn, which I provided a link to in the bottom right here, but some of the, the key drivers of the growth are, as we've talked about, the increasing number of data breaches. Um, ransomware has particularly grown ransomware attacks. Ransomware is a type of malicious software that when it infects a computer, what it does is it will encrypt all of the data on that machine, making it inaccessible to the to the owner of the machine uh, and only making it accessible to the attacker. And they basically demand a ransom, uh, sometimes in the millions of dollars, in order to uh, give the legitimate user an encryption key, uh, I'm sorry, a decryption key so that they can you know, use their own data. And ransomware has grown from 2017, looking at incidents like WannaCry, where over 100,000 organizations, including hospitals, were in, you know, infected and you know, couldn't take care of some of their patients. Some people died in those hospitals because of that attack back in 2017, um, to uh, the Colonial Oil Pipeline ransomware incident, which I mentioned in 2021. Even still today, in 2023, while things have gotten a little bit better, ransomware is still a significant uh, issue. Uh, also, there's many, many businesses that are in the midst of their digital transformations. So pretty much once your business goes uh, all digital or a larger percent digital than it was before, then the digital attack surface of the company also grows. Um, there's also been a lot more compliance regulations to follow. If we look at, for instance, in Europe, the uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation Act, and the version of it in California, CCPA, uh, are examples of regulations, you know, beyond the breach notification laws that first started here in California back in 2003. Uh, the final thing that I'll mention is that, as we've all probably been witnessing over the past several months, there has been a revel, and not just past several months, but past several years, there's been an absolute revolution taking place in the field of artificial intelligence, uh, leading to both uh, all kinds of positive benefits as well as all kinds of challenges. You know, uh, all kinds of positive benefits include things like being able to automate away jobs. So for instance, even the 750,000 open jobs that are available in the cybersecurity field, I don't think there's gonna be any way to fill those jobs realistically. We're gonna have to automate and we're gonna have to use AI to help us automate away some of the most entry level jobs. I'll also chat a little bit more about that. Um, but you know, there's also a whole bunch of downsides. Attackers are using artificial intelligence to generate better phishing emails than they were ever previously able to. So if previously one was able to detect a phishing email because there's bad grammar or bad spelling, like that's all gone, right? Attackers can now use AI uh, and services like ChatGPT to uh, generate their, their attacks for them. So there's a lot of reasons for this, for this growth. I thought it might be useful to talk about what may be the typical structure of a security team in, in a medium-sized company, typically headed up by um, you know, some head of security, whether it is a chief information security officer or whether it's, say, somebody in a director or VP level position uh, leading the organization. Uh, one way to organize a security team is to, say, have three different subgroups, one group uh, for GRC, typically called governance, risk, and compliance. Um, you know, followed by a group that focuses on security engineering, followed by a group that focuses on security operations. Uh, the GRC group will be responsible if the company has to comply with certain security standards like ISO 27000 or PCI to protect credit cards or HIPAA to protect healthcare information, whatever it happens to be, the compliance department can help do that. There have also been a lot of breaches that have happened due to third parties getting attacked first. So if we look at the breaches at JP Morgan Chase or Target back in 2014 and 2013, respectively, the way that they got broken into, given that they were very big corporations spending decent amounts on security, uh, but one can always spend more, um, attackers got broken in by targeting some of their suppliers and their vendors 
in the target breach, it was their heating and air conditioning provider that first got broken into. In the case of JP Morgan Chase, it was a uh, company that was running their website for charitable marathon races that got broken into first. Uh, so the government, governance risk and compliance group also typically handles third party risk and helping vet all the suppliers and third parties that a company works with to make sure that they have just as good security or better security, um, you know, ideally before they come on board as a supplier, but, but sometimes afterwards as well. Then there may be a, a group that has to focus on security engineering that has to focus on building and deploying the internal systems that help protect the corporation, as well as uh, helping protect the products or the software applications if the company builds software applications. And that's typically what goes on a security engineering team. Security operations teams typically deal with managing um, access to systems um, and the identities, uh, both the legitimate identities of the employees as well as the contractors to figure out who should be allowed to access what and why and what, you know, what roles should be given access to things. Uh, companies all can also bring in a whole bunch of threat intelligence so that when they get attacked, they can tell who is attacking them, who are their adversaries and um, how should they drive their security investments forward based on who is specifically targeting them. Many security operations group also have a security operations center, either run internally or run by a third party. And that group helps with things like uh, incident response, which, um, you know, incident response teams can sometimes be, uh, you know, dedicated sets of employees that focus on just responding to incidents, or sometimes they're virtual teams. You can imagine that there's trade-offs. So for instance, if you have a virtual incident response team and you pull other security people in or you pull people in from other departments when you're responding to an incident, uh, it may take away from some of the proactive work that those uh, parts of the company need to do to defend better. And so you don't want to get into this state where you're just you know, doing too much incident response and not doing enough proactive work. So anyhow, hopefully this gives a, a sense for what the structure of an example security team is and a medium size company, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk a little bit about different roles within this team so that you can get a sense of what cybersecurity jobs are like. And before we do that, one of the things that I wanted to do with regards to how to get a cybersecurity job, you may be in a particular job today. And one question that you might have is what kinds of roles might be most natural for me to go into if I want to get into cybersecurity. So in, the, in, in this slide and in the next one, what I do is I have a set of a, a table where on the left side, it lists a set of roles, say that you, one might currently have. So you might currently be a IT system administrator. You might currently be a network engineer. You might currently be a software developer. You might currently be a QA tester. And based on what your current role is, there might be certain cybersecurity roles that are just more natural for you to be able to go into given the experience that you've built to date. So what I've done on this slide, uh, and by the way, this, 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 this table comes from uh, the Big Breaches Cybersecurity Lessons for Everyone book. In the very last chapter, we talk about how you can get into the field of cybersecurity. Um, so here's a bunch of different roles that you can, you can go into. If you're an IT system administrator, you've, you've learned uh, what you need to do to build systems, deploy systems, you may also be used to having godlike powers on your network, for instance. And so with that set of experience, going into roles like cybersecurity analyst, information security analyst, um, SOC analyst, penetration tester, et cetera, those might be good roles to try to move to adjacently. Um, you know, if you're a quality assurance tester and you're somebody who's naturally curious to find bugs in software systems, then going into a role of a penetration tester or a vulnerability analyst may be a good role if you want to break into the field of cybersecurity. Um, because what penetration testers do is they, they, they're they pretty much trying to find certain kinds of bugs. They're trying to find certain kinds of bugs that could allow an attacker to break in to, to a company uh, or into a software system. If you've previously been a software architect, then becoming a security architect might be a good uh, way to go. And if you've been an IT engineer, moving into a role of a corporate security engineer might be might be a good way to go. Um, there's also some cybersecurity roles that are that are not as technical, that are maybe pseudo-technical, where you have to bridge both the technical and the non-technical aspects of what needs to get done. And so if, say, in the past, you've been a auditor for a, uh, say, financial audits, 
uh, then there might be the opportunity to go into a cybersecurity auditor position. All the big four companies, accounting companies that do financial audits also do cybersecurity audits. And learning, if you have past experience about what it's like to carry out an audit, the same, many of the same principles may apply. Uh, in order to do an audit on the financial side, for instance, you're going to ask for financial statements, you're going to ask for evidence that the books are being managed properly. And if you're a cybersecurity auditor, you're going to do the same for the field of cybersecurity. You're going to see uh, what are the different records that are being kept around, you know, what are all the assets that a company has? Uh, how have they been secured? What, what, what defenses are in place? What evidence can be provided around that? That's what cybersecurity auditors do. Um, I had mentioned earlier that in order to make changes at an organization, in order to achieve cybersecurity, uh, you typically need to get entire departments to make changes. Uh, and so project managers and product managers can help, especially security project managers can help roll such things out. If you're part of a software company and you're building a, a software product, then if the security of that product is important to the company, they may have one or more security product managers. Um, you know, back earlier in my own career at Google, uh, I had started at Google in 2005 as an engineer after, after um, you know, earning my, my degree from Stanford. And then I, after helping make a bunch of engineering contributions, I was asked if I wanted to serve as a product manager, a security product manager to help multiple groups um, with achieving security goals in, in the products and the internal offerings. So that's, that's a particular path that I have to take. <clears throat> you know, one other, uh, you know, pseudo technical cyber security role is that of a chief information security officer or a chief security officer abbreviated as CISO or, C or CSO. And, uh, you know, that, that's a, that's a role that I currently serve in, uh, today, um, uh, today at QuantumScape. I've, I've also been a CISO at, uh, Symantec and LifeLock. And those are definitely roles where, um, I'll talk about it in more detail, but you have to spend a lot of time working with the executive leaders at the company to help achieve security and make security a characteristic of the organization. Just like, you know, when a company builds a product, uh, they don't build a product and then try to make it a quality product. That's typically a, a hard path to follow rather characteristics like quality have to be built in from the beginning and the same holds true of security. So a CISO, one of the CISO's goals should be to help embed the characteristic of quality into the company's development and operations as things are getting built and, and rolled out. So in any case, that's a little bit about some pseudo technical cybersecurity roles. So what I'm going to do now is go through three of these roles and just talk a little bit about what the career path can look like. So let me start actually with the career path for security analysts, uh, sometimes also called security operations center analysts. The typical profile of a person that is a good fit to become a security analyst, uh, the typical entry level role, is that they should have some good foundations in information technology. Uh, if there's some foundation in security, that's great, but that's not a required must. The foundations in, in IT are the are the must. The other characteristics that are really good to have is natural curiosity. Uh, you want to dig deeper. You want to understand why things are the way they are. You want to understand how can you how can you make things better. And you think about all the different potential things that can go wrong in a very uh, you know risk. Uh, driven way. What's the what's the highest risk thing can go wrong? What's the next highest risk thing can go wrong? And what kind of countermeasures can we put in place in order to prevent against that? So for people that come from the financial field, they're usually used to thinking about uh, managing money in a way that you want to be uh, prepared for the worst, but you want to expect and or hope for the best. And so if you have that kind of characteristic, if you enjoy solving puzzles, if you enjoy detective shows, uh, those are great characteristics to uh, go into the cybersecurity field with as a, as a cybersecurity analyst. What cybersecurity analysts do is, if you think about things from the attacker standpoint, and you look at this flowchart that I have here, this flowchart shows what is the typical life cycle that an attacker goes through in order to break into an organization and complete their mission, whatever that happens to be, whether it be stealing intellectual property, taking a service off 
offline, stealing data, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the attackers typically start with doing some initial reconnaissance. Um, then they make an initial compromise. The attacker's goals typically involve compromising machines and or compromising accounts. Once they have compromised one or more machines or accounts, that's typically called their foothold. Uh, they, they establish their foothold. And then by uh, going about a series of activities, they grow their foothold. They compromise more machines. They compromise more accounts. They get more and more privileges inside of an organization. Uh, while they might have started doing external reconnaissance, once they have uh, done some of that external reconnaissance and have a foothold, then they start doing internal reconnaissance within an organization to understand what else can they take over? How can they move laterally? How do they continue to maintain their foothold and grow it until they can complete their mission? And what security analysts do is that when certain attempted attacks come in, like phishing attacks or malware attacks, security analysts are typically the people that are on the front line identifying that that initial compromise has occurred and then taking steps to go ahead and kick them out. So let's say that say somebody's, uh, somebody received a phishing email. They got lured to a website, which lured them to provide their username and password. Well, the second that they perhaps realized that they might've been duped or there's some internal systems that identify that that event has happened, the security analyst will go in, um, start working with that user to change their credentials as fast as possible, right? Just because an initial compromise has occurred, it doesn't mean that it's game over, right? So if you can change the credentials and then the attacker can no longer use the compromised credentials to log into accounts and view activities within systems, then you can cut those attackers off. Similarly with malware, if a machine gets infected, that happens all the time. But the important thing is to, to basically, once a machine's been infected, uh, identify it, contain it, cut that machine off and, and say re-image that machine with a new operating system and a new set of applications. And security analysts are typically the people that are on the front line for helping do that kind of work, as well as automating that kind of work. As, as we're, we're in a world here where artificial intelligence and a whole bunch of things are used to automate, um, those are the things to automate. One of the things I've done here in this slide is talk about what are the root causes of breaches and what are the typical kinds of activities that security analysts do. I already talked about the example of how you can reset credentials once a phishing attack has happened to prevent the attacker from doing anything bad. I talked about malware a little bit. Um, I don't have time to talk about all these uh, items, but uh, these are the kinds of things that security analysts do to help mitigate the root causes of a breach. Um, you know, I would encourage folks that want to become security analysts to develop familiarity with how attacks are carried out. Um, if you're, say, a quality assurance tester and you want to become a security analyst, I encourage you to try out a tool called Metasploit, which is a toolkit that can help you actually mount attacks. And then once you understand how to mount attacks, please do this safely. Please do this only on test systems. Don't do this on production systems. Once you understand how attacks are carried out, you can also then understand very well how you can cut off attacks you know, that are in progress or attempted attacks. I would also encourage you to learn about uh, scripting, programming, and automation. As there are so many security analyst roles and we just won't be able to fill them in the field, the important thing to do is to figure out how can you automate out the most basic activities. So if, for instance, you want to become a security analyst, and there's different levels of security analyst, you know, starting with level one, going up to level two, going up to level three, et cetera. Different organizations may have different levels. Um, but you know, uh, you, I mean, you don't want to become a level one security analyst whose job then just gets outsourced later on. So to prevent that, what you do is you become a security analyst and you also learn about programming and scripting and automation. And then you can help automate all the tasks that the security analyst can do. If you look at the typical definitions of a level two or a level three security analysts, they're typically the folks who automate away the level one activities. So we're, uh, we're, we're still far ways from having even the level one jobs automated out of the world. But if we want to make as much progress in the field as we can, I would recommend learning about programming and scripting and automation, uh, you know, to become a security analyst that gets up to that level two, level three tier, and then can take on other roles as well. Another career path to enter the field of cybersecurity is that of a security architect. Uh, my, my biggest piece of advice is to make sure you become a good software architect first, become a, a good software developer, become a good software engineer, become a good programmer, and then become a software architect and then 
become a security architect. And the reason I suggest that order is because once you pursue things in that order and you understand what it takes to develop good software, then and you establish credibility as a software architect, then what you can do is help give advice to other software architects and other software engineers. Uh, and because you have that credibility and you know their pains and you know that they're trying to you know, launch uh, a new uh, feature every week and they're, they're you know, working on the stories and the testing and the, the whole DevOps part of it, because you understand their world, you'll be able to give them better advice that they'll, that they'll receive. Um, I'd also encourage you to learn about different types of software security attacks, whether they be buffer overflows, code injections, SQL injections, uh, cross-site scripting attacks, cross-site request forgery attacks. We cover a lot of these uh, types of attacks in our web applications uh, course here at, here at Stanford. Um, and then to, to kind of graduate and kind of like get that, get that Jedi, uh, you know, uh, credibility, I would encourage you to find some zero day vulnerabilities in existing software projects, perhaps open source projects. A zero day vulnerability is simply a, a, a software vulnerability, a bug that simply hasn't been discovered yet, where you're the first to find it. And if you get credited for those CVEs, then uh, uh, CVE stands for Common Vulnerability Enumeration. It's a designation, it's an identifier that's given to a vulnerability once you find it and you report it to the National Vulnerability Database. So if you if you can get some credit for finding some you know zero day vulnerabilities or the first one to find them, that positions you very well to be a to be a respected software security architect. Um, let's see, I don't have much time to talk about uh, other things on that on that front. Um, uh, you can of course read the last chapter of the Big Reaches book, um, but let me also cover the CISO career path. So if you want to become a chief information security officer, my advice would be to develop you know, two to four domain spikes in certain areas of information security. Uh, I don't think there is any chief security officer out there that's an expert at everything cybersecurity. The field is so broad these days that I think it makes sense to develop uh, spikes uh, in certain domains. So for instance, you know, before I became a chief information security officer, I had uh, become an expert in uh, web application security. I had become an expert in anti-malware defenses. I had also become an expert in certain niche areas like click fraud and malicious advertising. Um, and, and it's good to have those domain spikes so that you make sure you understand the principles, the principal tenets of the field, and you have some operational experience with them. I think every CISO should hire uh, relevant uh, you know, uh, directors or VPs or principals that help complement out for other areas where they don't have the, the, the depth of experience and listen to them. Um, I would also encourage you, if you want to become a CISO, to get experience doing different hands-on jobs within, within a security team so that you understand the different parts of what the security organization does. If you can get some experience with engineering, security engineering, some experience with security operations, some experience with compliance, those are great experiences that will help you do the job better and understand the pains that your directs are going through. Um, I would also encourage you to, you know, if you're interested in becoming a CISO, develop a lot of soft skills because it's really the soft skills and the relationships that you make with other people at the company, uh, whether it be the CEO or other folks that will help you get the job done. And then I think it's also very important to become a, a good explainer and a storyteller. Steve Jobs, who was the previous CEO at Apple, the first CEO, the co-founding CEO at Apple, uh, he he said that the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. Uh, I agree with that. I think it's important to be able to explain to especially non-technical and pseudo-technical people all the complex technical stuff, but with all the complex without all the complex technical stuff. You know, explain things using analogies whenever whenever you can, so long as the analogies are decent enough. So that's a little bit of advice if you want to get on the path to become a chief information security officer. How do you get started? Make sure you know the basics of information technology whether it be networking, cryptography, databases, software entering, artificial intelligence, um, and, and then take a course uh, such as the Foundations of Information Security course that we have here at Stanford. That's one great way to get started. Um, there's a bunch of resources here to learn the basics of information technology and computer science. Uh, Stanford, uh, the Center for Professional Development has Computer Science 101, which is a great course. There's a whole bunch of other great online courses as well out there. Um, 
I, after, after you understand the basics, I would then encourage you to take a course such as Foundations of Information Security. Uh, Foundations of Information Security course that we have here at Standard at Stanford starts with me interviewing uh, Vint Cerf, who uh, is regarded as the father of the internet. He co-architected TCP IP together with Bob Kahn back in the 70s, and the entire internet runs on it now. I interview him not only about the history of the internet, but the history of security of the internet. One of the things that we'd like to do here with our courses at Stanford is help people not just develop skills and develop some knowledge to help them enter the field, but we'd love to help develop the next generation of leaders that can help take the field forward in this historical context as to uh, where, where, where the field started, where we are now, and where we need to take things forward is just super important context. And so, uh, so, so beyond understanding the foundations of IT and computer science, understanding the foundations of information security would be a good next step. And then beyond that, for folks that want to become security architects or that want to become chief information security officers, and I was only able to briefly touch upon three of these roles, um, there's some additional courses that you can take. Um, summary, there's a lot of opportunity to get involved in cybersecurity. There's many roles available. Not, of the, not all of them are, are deeply technical. Um, uh, so please, please consider joining the field. I'd be happy to take a few questions. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, I always learn so much uh, from you. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, one question that keeps coming up, and I know you touched on that a little bit, is for people who don't have the technical background, like how to get started. And I know you mentioned some courses they could take a look at, uh, but like what is like what do you advise them? Like how to get started be besides like getting some kind of background information about the field, like in terms of like how to find a job, where to look, um, who to get in contact with, uh, what would be your advice? Great. So let's start with um, how to how to get involved. I mean, I'd start with just you know going on Google News or other sources, uh, searching for cybersecurity, get a sense of what's going on in the world. Right. That that's the that's the first place to start. Um, you know, I'd encourage uh, you know you to you know read 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 a book or two. Um, I think if you don't have the technical background, it is important to take a, uh, a basic computer science course or a basic foundations of information technology course, because you know if you don't understand the basics of uh, networking and databases, then it's going to be hard to, uh, for instance, uh, be able to go through network traffic to identify well where is the attack coming from and what a you know what's what's going on there. Um, so I would I would encourage. Uh, you know, to, to build some some basic technical uh, depth, and then Petra, you had said you had you had also asked, um, you know, what's a, what's a good place to get started? Well, I would I would encourage people to you know go on LinkedIn, uh, look at look at. So I think that in order to get a job in a field, it is important to develop the knowledge. It is important to get a certification. So for instance, the uh, professional certifications that we have here at Stanford are are, are good certifications to get, like the the uh, foundations of information security or the advanced cybersecurity certification are, are great to get. Uh, but as we know in the world, it's not just about what you know. It is to an extent also, uh, you know, uh, you know, unfortunate or not, about who you know. So I would encourage you to get on LinkedIn. I would encourage you to connect with people in your in your professional circle and figure out who um, you know might be working in a in a security team somewhere, right? Um, and ask them about what kind of roles are available. Uh, ask for you know just an, an informational session you know you don't have you know the, the way to get a job is not just you know uh, get a certification and then start applying uh, and try to get interviews that that's a very hard process right there's so many resumes that come in for every job that I would encourage people to reach out to people that they know interview them uh, just exploratory interviews learn about what's going on in their world what kind of problems are they are they solving uh, what, what kind of skills do they need? For their company, um, and once you once you once you learn their particular needs, once you have some certification, then that's a good. Then the next step is to try to get kind of the formal job interview. But there's so much that you can learn by just talking to people, meeting people, whether it be online or in person. Hearing you don't need PhD degree uh, in order to get a job. That's that's kind of what I keep hearing from you. <laughs> That is correct. You don't need a PhD to get a job in cybersecurity. <laughs> Most people don't have PhDs. Um, you know, I think if you have some bachelor's degree, and by the way, it doesn't have to be in computer science. It could be electrical engineering. It could be mechanical engineering. I think having a bachelor's degree in some technical field 
is, is a great start. And even if you don't have a bachelor's degree in a technical field, there are CISOs that uh, grew up as lawyers, right? So uh, having some, some uh, educational background is good. Um, and, you know, such folks, even if you don't come from a technical field, you can learn the, the, the basics of the technical field and then go from there. Great. Thank you so much, Neil. We are unfortunately at a time. Uh, we did get a lot of questions. So just for people who are still with us, we took notes. Uh, we, you know, kind of wrote down all of them and we will have a follow up discussion with Neil. Uh, we will try to find a way how to basically share the knowledge. For, we apologize if we couldn't get to your question like right during this call, but it was definitely valuable to hear what you're curious about. So we know what to ask uh, next. Thank you so much, Neil. This was a wonderful session, uh, hopefully very practical for folks, but I definitely learned a lot about uh, what is happening in the industry, what people need to know, what types of jobs there are. So thank you so much. Um, have a nice day, everybody, or like evening, morning, wherever you are. I appreciate you could join us. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Hope you learned a thing you didn't know before and look forward to being in touch.